Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the show. This evening, my guest will be Detective McFadden from the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department Homicide Unit. How you doing there, Detective McFadden? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Thank you for coming on the show. You're welcome. You're welcome. How long have you been a detective for the Homicide Unit? Well, I, I joined the department in 1982 after finishing Johnson C. Smith, and I have been a detective since 1985. So, uh... 26 years uh, doing this job as far as uh, detective work. What do you like the most about being a detective? Well, most of it, uh, in my earlier career, I loved um, the investigative part of it. You know, just getting out, solving crime, you know, talking to witness. In my latter years, I like more of being in the community, um, talking with the people in the community, seeing the community, um, so-called godfathers and godmothers and the kids as they grew up. And so in my la latter years, I enjoy that much more now. Hmm. Do you ever take your job personal when you're at that crime scene, you know, and you see that type of, that crime? I mean, that... I don't take it personal. Uh, a lot of times it does affect me um, when it's a child involved or as we investigate the case, um, several cases that, you know, touch your heart. You know, I had a case where a young lady um, took her life, took her two kids' life, and that was very hard. And in dealing with that, um, I kept up with the kids that survived. Um, and I like that part of it, and, but I don't take it personal. I can't um, because it's my job. I know you stated earlier about having an incident with dealing with a family that you had a, a crime with. I mean, as far as having that type of homicide. Yeah, one family, um, it's sad, I don't want to say service, but um, I have investigated uh, four of their family members' case in my 20-year career in homicide. And um, in investigating the case, I had actually investigated the mother, and then this past May, I investigated that mother's son's, um, her, her son's case. And, and in dealing with the family, and they saw me again, you know, it wasn't a pleasant thing, but, you know, they greeted me well, but then I, we reflect back on what happened. Um, in the 90s. So that's, that's hard. That's, that's kind of hard. What type of support does the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department provide to the victim? Well, we have a homicide victim support group. Um, if you're a victim, um, if your family member is a victim of a homicide, you know, your son, your wife, or anything, we have an excellent homicide support group. If you go to the cmpd.org website, you can click on the um, homicide support group. They meet once or twice a month. Uh, they're very supportive because only the people who have been through that can actually tell you what they're going through. So it is a very good group. They meet and they very much are supportive of each other during the time. Why do you recommend families participating in support groups like that? Well, a lot of times people think that they can handle the pressure, handle the distress. You know, everybody who comes to the funeral is going to say, I'm going to be there for you. Give me a call. Call me. Three or four weeks goes on, happens. Nobody's there for you. The trial starts. You know, you go to the trial three and four days, then the days turn into weeks. That is when you need to support. That is when the group comes in. But then we also want to help you get through the first couple of weeks. And, you know, the United Family Services is an organization here also that also helps families get through that crisis, you know, Anything from clothing, housing, but definitely counseling. Definitely counseling. Being a homicide detective, what would be like a typical day? We don't have a typical, typical day. Um, as of uh, yesterday, the day before, um, we get up, come to work with everything planned to do. Um, we, get, uh, not, we have to investigate um, unattended deaths. We in death investigate suicides. We investigate infant deaths. So all of these things happen in a typical day. We could go out on three or four different cases a day that has nothing to do with homicide, unattended death, unexplained deaths. We do it all. So uh, there's nothing typical about our day, not at all. Do you feel that the community is as involved as should be in the type of crimes that we're having? No. And I'll say no, and I'll say no, and I'll say no. The mm -hmm. reason why... We get involved when it is newsworthy or it's a crisis. So there, if, if somebody's killed, you know, everybody wants to rally, everybody wants to march, 
but that only lasts a day or two. But where we need to always inform our community and have them aware that there is violence out there, that there are crimes being committed, but we have to be more involved with our kids. We're losing our kids every day to the violence and stuff on the street, and that is senseless. And I think that becoming more involved, and not just the rallies, mm -hmm. not just the stop the violence rallies and the balloons and the hot dogs, educate your kids, have them at the church, have them at the school, and have somebody come out and tell them what it's like to be in a gang, or what it's like if you want to sell drugs, or what it's like if you want to steal. So I think all these things would be helpful if we can get the community more involved and really let them sit back and say, I don't want this to happen to my son, or I don't want this to happen to my daughter. In your opinion, do you think the churches, are they as involved as they could be? Not at all. It, it should be more. The churches are not only, should not only be open on Sunday. It should be open on Saturday night. It should be open on Monday through Friday. Hmm. Sunday, we will still re let that remain as worship. Hmm. But education, prevention, and support should handle all through the week. And we should have these type of programs every day of the week. And I think the churches definitely could do more and definitely be more supportive of the mentoring groups and the things that happen in the city. When we see a crime, I know sometimes we have that snitching type of mentality that we don't want to tell when we see some type of thing. Why is it important that we get involved in something like that and help solve the problem, the crime? Well, let me just clear up snitching for my opinion. Okay. Snitching was designed during the civil rights era or during the eras when we were trying to gain better during the struggle. So mm -hmm. don't come to the meeting and we are forming our plan and then you go out and tell the people who are going to oppress us. Mm -hmm. So I think if you can allow somebody to come into your neighborhood and kill somebody in your neighborhood, then that's not snitching. You come and say, well, look, I don't want this violence in my neighborhood. You know, and then if they're reluctant about coming to talk to us, we can always talk to you through Crime Stoppers, or you can just be an anonymous caller. But just give us enough information to get us to that point, you know, so we can continue our investigation and prevent more crimes in your neighborhood. So snitching, you can look at it that way. If it happens in your neighborhood and you still allow it to happen, why don't you just come and tell the truth and not label it as snitching? Mm. Do you feel that we get only involved when it's pertaining to us? You know what I'm saying? When, when something happens to our family members, we want people to get involved, but we kind of like want to stay back to the rear when it's somebody else, when it's not touching home. We do, and, and I tell people it will touch your house sooner or later. Violence, crimes, or some issues are will touch your family, and then you want that same family to come out. And usually what I tell the family, if, if this was your son, wouldn't you want somebody to come forward? If this was your daughter, wouldn't you want somebody to come forward and give us that information so we can solve these crimes? So I put it back on their hearts most of the time. And most of the time we get, we get a good response. How, what type of, as far as Chief Monroe, how much does this emphasize as far as y'all getting out there and exactly, you know, solving these crimes and stuff like that? Does he really? He's a, he's a different chief. Let me tell you, he's a different chief. And uh, he is my seventh chief that I have worked under. And he is definitely different. Uh, he's definitely um, for good in the community. Uh, chief Romo strives for crime to be down and crime needs to be down. And he will see it to crime to be down. Um, for in implementing new programs, been ha absolutely great at it. Um, and you can't fool it. You know, if you think you're going to tell him something and then say, this is how I got my numbers down, he will make sure that these numbers are down, not just on paper, but show us how you got the numbers down. So he's a great chief, I think. And not just because, you know, I work for him, I think he's a great man. Being, since he's coming to office as the chief, what type of changes have you seen within uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department? Work, just absolutely work. Just, you have to get the job done. Whatever it takes, whatever it costs, we need it done. And, and I think that's a good attitude. You know, most people say, well, that may cost us too much, or we're using too much manpower, or we don't need the dogs, the helicopters, and the boat out there. It doesn't matter to him. If it happens, we're gonna bring everything out to prevent it, curb it, or find a problem. 
So uh, definitely the work ethic behind it. He's great at that. I know they talk about, there's a big issue about the funding that's going on in all these programs. How is the issue of funding within your department? I mean, we, have, we have problems just like anybody else. You know, we have to watch our budget. We have to watch, you know, spending. So I think we are doing all right. You know, at always we can do, we can do um, more with more. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, we cut back on a couple of things, you know, a couple of schools, a couple of things that we don't usually spend money on. But we're going to be fine. You know, I, I think we still be fine because what we do, we train more indoors because we have people that who's been on the department who's training in other cities. And uh, like myself, I could actually talk to the younger recruits or the younger officers about what we expect from them on the crime scene. So you look inside and see what you got and train from within. So, you know, so things like that would save us money. That's great. Being that I'm a parent, you know, um, what type of advice can you give me as far as telling my sons as far as things that they should be really educated on as far as in this community? Well, I think the community is going to give you a, a wide variety of things. My thing is what I tell all the kids, the choices that you make is more important than anything else. You're going to still see people sell drugs. You're going to see people steal. Your friends are going to steal. Your friends are going to sell drugs. Your friends are going to drink too much alcohol, get in a car wreck, or get a DWI or DUI. What I tell them, the choices that you make is the more important. So you look at what will be the final outcome before you do something. If I go in the store and my friend steals something, am I going to be also associated with him as a thief? Probably yes. And if he gets caught and you get caught, you're going to get caught just because he's stealing and being along with him. So you have to look at it as the choices that you make every day when you're with your friends or when you're by yourself. But that peer pressure, I mean, it's really big because I see a lot of the kids, they wear their pants down low because of the fact that they see their friends wearing it down low. Most of them do. But if you ask them why they do it, they, they see somebody else do it. So I think if you take the time and say, hey, this is not good really, really getting the child life, only just telling the kid, pull your pants up, he's not going to pull his pants up. Have a conversation with him. Build a relationship with him. And I think it's, it's piece by piece. You may learn something from him, and he definitely learned something from you. Peer pressure is a big part of it. But I always tell the kids, if peer pressure is that much that it's going to allow you to go to jail, then you fail. You fail. Your choices weren't good. It, it, it just weren't good. Peer pressure will always be here. I had peer pressure. I'm sure that you had peer pressure. But then, you know, you have to make the right choices to not to let that peer pressure send you to prison or to jail. So that's what I tell them. You know, just because he's doing it, just because everybody else is jumping off the cliff don't mean you have to jump off the cliff. You can go and look down and say, okay, everybody else jump. I'm not going to make that choice not to jump either. I know you have a lot of passion for the youth and a lot of programs that they have pertaining to youth and stuff like that. How do you really take it when you see a youth just being killed? It is hard. Um, I've seen a lot of kids that I've known over the years being killed. Um, a lot of family mem members of youth uh, come and talk to me about their son or daughter being killed. And that's the hardest part. And that's why I love the kids. I always love the kids. If anything, dealing with the kids and the young adults, I'm for it. Because uh, I have buried too many over the years, you know, year after year. You know, I go to the high school and speak on, at the 11th graders who are coming back as rising seniors. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, some of you all will not be back. And every time I go to the high school and one does not come back from the summer, I get a phone call. Hopefully, I have changed some of them lives in that time. But the youth is a big thing for me. Mm. Yes. What do you like doing? I mean, on personal, other than being a homicide, well, what do you like? I love uh, grilling out. Um, my house has five grills, oh. smokers, and I love to grill out. Um, other than that, I love the fly fish. You know, that's when you're standing in the middle of the water, you know, whipping the fly fish and rod. The real, I love that. that that's, that's my passion. Oh. So. To get away from that stressful job that you have, what do you do? I mean, that's, do that's when I fly fish. I have actually, if I come to work at 4 o'clock, I'll get in my car at 5 o'clock in the morning, drive up to the mountains, stand in the stream, fly fish for three or four hours, have lunch by myself, and drive back to Charlotte. And that, that has been absolutely 
the best stress release I've ever had. And um, I've been doing that for the last eight years. The last eight years. Family. You have a family in marriage? Yes, I have, have three, three kids and a, a wonderful wife. And um, they don't care anything about my job. They, uh, they talk to their friends. They say, this is my dad. This is what he does. You know, I don't have to. I have never been to a show and tell, or my kids have never pre presented me at their school ever in my career. I'm just dad at home. Don't mean nothing about it. You don't, they don't care. You know, they just, they just treat me as dad. They don't see nothing different about it. How important has it been in your life to have that supporting cast of wife and children? Well, it has been great. I, I, I don't know why they're even still with me half of the time. You know, I spent my last 20 years leaving home, missing ball games, missing birthday parties, missing family reunion, but they had always been there for me. Uh, my wife is exceptional. Uh, she works just as hard as I do, and um, she supports me. Uh, my kids, they're fabulous at times. You know, they're still teenagers, so, you know, we... And dad is still dad, so that's the only part that we don't see eye to eye is Facebook and MySpace and the cell phone and the internet and iPhone. But we still have a lot of fun with it. And, uh, but they support me. Uh, they don't bother dad when dad's tired, right. you know, and dad had a long day, but they definitely are supportive of me very much. Why do you feel that's so important that the men get involved with, the, with their kids? Because when I interview these boys and young men about um, their lives, they talk about their dads. They talk about their dads not being in their lives. Um, a young man that um, was convicted, we convicted him last year. His father came to me in court and said, this is not your fault. This is my fault because I was not in my son's life. And I, see, and I saw him since that, and we talked about it. And he said, how much did he wish he could be there for his son now, which his son did get life in prison. Mm. And I think it's very important because boys, no matter how great our wives and mothers are, Boys still need that man in their life just to talk to them about this personal stuff that they're going through. You know, no girlfriend, got a girlfriend. You know, my son went through a little thing with one of his girlfriends. He wasn't doing everything that she wanted him to do. We thought that she was the perfect girl. They had a nice conversation one day, and we never saw her again. And, you know, and then he went, he, he, he dealt with that for a while. He went through a lot with that. God, that's... that's... Yep, so it's, it's, we have a personal life also. And that's great. That's great. Yeah. Communication, how important is that? Not only within your family, but with your friends and outside. Communication. Communication is great. My friends uh, all know what I do. Um, sometimes I go home, um, call the guys up and say, look, I'm just coming, coming just to hang out. And that means I just need a break from Charlotte. And, you know, they'll fire you up the barbecue pit. And we'll go down there and we'll sit around and talk and laugh about football and laugh about old times. So support and communication is great for me. You know, I have a great support group, great, you know, long line of supporters uh, over the years. And family members of past victims have been very much supportive of me. I've spoken at uh, many funerals of um, victims' mothers and mm -hmm. attend uh, family functions with family. So the communication part of talking about it has been great for me. It's been really great. Okay, I know you deal with uh, the victims, but the people that are found guilty of that crime, do you ever get in contact with them? And a lot of them. I talk to a lot of the families um, because we were in court with these families half the time. We walk out of court, and, and I give them the respect um, that every mother should and every father should. And, you know, we talk about it. You know, it may not be extensive, but I'll greet them and say, how y'all doing today, and everything's all right. And, you know, we... We live part of their lives also, so I know what's going on in their lives. And we'll talk a little bit about that, you know, how the other son is doing or, or how the daughter of the gentleman that we may be trying. You know, we talk to them. They're human, and they, because we never know. Unfortunately, some of the people that, sons that I have sent to prison, I even had to work on their loved one's death, you know, mm -hmm. a mother or a father or, or a sibling. And um, when I come around then, I'm glad I did the first part of it of breaking the ground, and, and we get along. You know, not all of them, you know, because I am, you know, sending your son to jail, and then I'm trying to work a case with your son. So not all of them are agreeable with my method, but, you know, they understand. Do they also understand that you're not sending their son, daughter to jail, but they're sending their self? I try to get them that message. It's not me. I'm sitting at home in bed or sitting someplace, and then the phone rings, and I got to go. And because of that meeting, 
places me and you here. And that's what I tell them. And not because it's something I did. It's something that your loved one did, your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife did that caused us to be here at this time. Because of that, do not hold this against me. And I'm going to be fair with you. And I don't have to lie. And I don't have to do all this thing. And if you want to know something within the law that I could tell you, I'm going to share that with you. I'm going to tell you why I'm arresting your son and what is some of the evidence that is against your son. And I do that because they're human. The parents don't, you know, we can hold them responsible, but so much. You know, and it goes back to choices. So I, I try to help the families understand why I'm doing my job. They got a new law coming out, the Katie Law. It's dealing with uh, taking DNA from people who's being arrested. How do you feel about that law, the pros and cons? Well, it's a good, I think it's a good thing. Um, most people will say, well, it's a violation of my rights. Uh, you know, you're only taking my DNA. But, you know, there's a lot of violence out here, and it's a lot of things happen. And I think that the people who say don't do it and something happens to their loved ones, and then if DNA can help solve that case, they would want that. They would want that. You know, we, as law enforcement, we want, we want that. We want every resource available to us when we are, we are trying to uh, clear these cases and solve these crimes. We need any help that we can get. And DNA is a fabulous thing. And it has always been, and hope it stay around, and hope they may even advance it further than what it is. But I think that I'm for it, 100% for it. Basically, doing that DNA, what does it really, I mean, entail? I mean, It says, my finger is on that cup. Nobody else's DNA but mine. Now, the only issue that we have now is identical twins. Because if you are identical twins, your DNA is identical. Okay. But, you know, just your basic DNA, if, if I pick up that cup and you pick up that cup and we switch them around and we swab both of these cups for the DNA, scientists can say which one of us pick up which cup. Mm -hmm. And we are both sitting here. So th that's, that's the kind of stuff that we're looking for, stuff that we can have tangible in court, ready available with scientific evidence with no questions asked. And that's why we love DNA. So do they put like, when something happens within that crime scene, do they take like DNA from that victim and do they put it in like a computer or something like that? How we have, um, if they have DNA from the crime scene that is not the victim, if we get swab in this cup and we swab the, the rim of this cup and we collect DNA, we send it, we send it to a place thing called CODIS. And CODIS is a, the system which, talking about the law, that puts all the DNA into the machine. So it's not like I'm looking for the DNA and says, which one is the DNA? The machine says it's the DNA. After the machine makes what we call the hit, the DNA says, this is Mr. McFadden's DNA on this cup. Then I'll go to Mr. McFadden, take his DNA one-on-one, -on -one, so I know I'm taking his DNA, Correct. and then also compare it to the same DNA off the cup and his DNA to confirm the match. So just because the machine says it, machine says, this is it. So we go to Mr. McFadden, get his DNA and says, I'm gonna take your DNA, compare it with the DNA off the cup and compare this to DNA and that is how we get our match. So we're only confirming what the machine has done. So lately we've seen a lot of people being released from prison after spending a long period of time because of that DNA being taken. Well, some of it is DNA, and then some of it is, um, lack of a better word, sloppy police work. Mm -hmm. And what happens is a lot of people think everybody's getting out of jail because of DNA. That is not true. A lot of it is because there's evidence that was held back and not brought forward oh, okay. into the case. And then that's called the discovery. Mm -hmm. When now in North Carolina, whatever I write down on a sheet of paper, whatever I do on the case, if you send me an email that says, go and check to see if the gun is under the bed, that email is called discoverable. Mm -hmm. I should present that to the defense who is support, who is this young man's lawyer. If I don't do that, I'm in violation of the law. So when they look back and there's a lot of evidence that wasn't given to the defense attorney, then they say something is wrong and this is when uh, a lot of people are released. So it's not only DNA, it's a lot of things involved in that. Okay, we're running close on the end of the show. I'm what type of advice would you give to the community to, to be, um, you know, to solve this problem as far as the crime? I think we need to get involved more, be supportive of your community. 
I came from a community where the only thing we saw every, every weekend was some guy walking down the street intoxicated. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they, they had, him and his wife had their problems, but the community was involved. The whole community was involved. And I think that's where we need to get back to, having the community involved, being aware what goes on in your community, and the crime in your community. You know, if somebody's in somebody's driveway and you know they're going out of town, you can pick up the phone, call 911, and if that is a family member, so be it. But at least we know we've taken care of that and made sure that that is a family member. So I think the community needs to be involved. I want everybody to have a wonderful day, and I want people to do, live like my mother can, who can sit on their porch Correct. and watch the time go by. Well, that was a very good time. It was a very good time. Mm. As far as you, how long do you feel like you want to stay as far as a homicide detective? Well, believe it or not, I'm at the end of my career. I, I have 29 years in. I have a year of sick leave that I have never taken. Yeah. So within the next six or seven months, I can retire. I can retire from the police department, full benefits. But now, whether I do it, that'll be a different story. Detective McFadden, I'd like to say thank you for coming on the show. And anytime you want to come back on the show and just enlighten the community on not only your job, but yourself, you're more than welcome. I'll be glad to. I'll be glad to. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for watching the show. I'm, we have another exciting guest next week. Until you meet again, join my website, www.paulmbrown.webs.com. Come on every Thursday at 530. You have a good evening. Thank you. I'd like to welcome you to the show. Tonight, I have two special guests, Reverend Charles Williams to my left from Whispering Hope Ministries, and to my right, I have Detective Gary McFadden from the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department Homicide Unit. How y'all gentlemen doing? How are you, Paul? Doing great.